alert to the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the morning with Laura Stiles and Rosenberg. Listen, y'all, it's Ebro and Rosenberg today. Laura is on assignment. Uh, mommy duty has called. And we got D-Rock and my brother Wayne Barrow, the architects of the most recent I got a story to tell documentary of B.I.G. on Netflix, which bravo, gentlemen. It is phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. D- when Rock. did you guys realize that this was going to be like really the thing? I mean, when did that dawn on you? Like this? Oh, this is going to be it. Um, um, you want to jump in first? Right, this one. Um, just the direction that they was going with it. For me, you know what I mean? Just the direction they was going with it, with the uh, guy Emmett. So he, you know, just, just they just wanted to get to know, just like a different type of story. You got to know Chris, you know what I mean? Before, you know, Notorious B.I.G. or whatever, just not dwelling on all the beefs and all that stuff, just a different angle. You know what I'm saying? So that's when I kind of knew, like, okay, this is what I always wanted to do for, for years. I was just, like, tired of talking about all the drama and all that stuff. It didn't really, you know, it didn't really make sense for me. What about you, Wayne? Well, I mean, I knew honestly from the gate because, you know, I knew what the vision was and I knew what we wanted to do. Um, I just need to pull all of the pieces together um, to make sure that we were able to implement it. And D-Rock was one of those pieces that was more critical than, than most because everybody else has spoken. And Rocket, to me, is the one that story needed to be told. And yeah, from my own perspective, I thought that that was the most critical part to the whole people. Well, and D-Rock, you were sitting on the gold, man. Like, I mean... Yes. Had, how many times had people approached you about trying to get access to the endless tapes that you have? Uh, since March 10th, 1997. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Word. I just, you know, like I said, it was mostly like a like a visual diary for me. I never really looked at it like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, I got footage on big. It was personal for me. So right. I never really was looking to do nothing like that with that. Was yes. that the hardest thing for you, D-Rock, was um, because you're so close to this in so many ways, getting to this point of this is your friend, man. This is your this is your guy, you know? Is yeah. that the hardest thing? Yeah, definitely. That shit was super emotional. Like I said, them, like I would only really look at them joints like, like tonight, being that like tomorrow is March 9th or around his birthday. I usually look at that stuff and sometimes I just bury it. Like five years might go by, I just you know, don't even want to look at the shit. It's just like emotional, but like I said, it's like a diary for me. You know what I mean? <clears throat> how, how many tapes you know do you mean? have? So like- how, for people who don't know, if you haven't seen the film yet, and I could not recommend it more, um, on Netflix right now, Biggie. I got a story to tell. It's the best piece of media I've ever seen on Biggie. D Rock, D Rock's tapes are the centerpiece of the of the footage you see. How many tapes would you say you have from over the years? Um, for over the years, I probably got about close to about seven hundred. Oh my but, lord! But for that, we only used about what about ten, Wayne? Ten or fifteen? Uh, and ten, eleven? Yeah, yeah, ten, eleven tapes out of I got tons of shit. But like I said, those particular tapes just fit that story we was trying to tell. You know what I mean? Like I said, I'm 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 about to do some shit from a different set of eyes. You know what I mean? So, you know, got something else following up. Now, D Rock, did you? Did this help you uh, in being able to do this? You know, we've talked many times throughout the years, and I appreciate your friendship, man. But how much did you discover about this being uh, uh, almost therapy for you, if at all? Definitely. Absolutely. It definitely was therapy for me. And that that was another like part of the reason, too, why I actually held on it so long, just so I wouldn't have to go through all of that stuff again. But, I mean, I guess it was time like. I guess 10 years ago, nobody probably would really appreciate it. I think there's everybody sitting down right now and they actually got a chance to really, you know, look, everybody's watching movies now. So, you know what I mean? But it, it was definitely therapy for me. It was definitely therapy and it helped me out a lot. Actually, that's what Wayne was trying to tell me for a minute. Like, yo, you just probably need to just get a lot of, get a lot of that stuff off your chest and then, you know what I mean? To move forward. So, I mean, that's, that's great. That's, that's a great way to put it. It definitely was therapy for me. For me, um, Ebro. Uh, uh, Wayne, I wanted to ask you. Um, D Rock talked about the, the this not being about the drama and this being a different direction, and that was there were a handful of things that really stood out about this doc. But the mm-hmm. fact that this was not a Biggie Tupac story, it was covered, 
It was it was you could see the importance it held in Biggie's uh, mind and heart, and then you moved on. It's really mm-hmm. frustrating as a fan, as someone who was down from party and bullshit. It's really mm-hmm. frustrating to see their stories completely overlapped. Did you express from the beginning like this is going to be a Biggie story? And and because I thought you did a phenomenal job telling just his story. All right. Thank you. Um, yes, it was definitely a conscious uh, you know, decision to make. One, um, there, there's been so much negativity about just one thing anyway. And one of the things that was important, you know, in terms of having our initial conversations with Emmett was that um, we need to humanize Christopher. We need to make people understand that this was a man, a father, a son, a friend to many, right? Um, and at the end of the day, we couldn't keep perpetuating the same negative instant uh, elements that was out there that has been perpetuated by the media even. So, um, and from our own standpoint, we wanted to tell something to the fans and, and that was different and compelling, strong, truthful, and authentic. And the best way to do that is to, to really talk about how Christopher Wallace became Notorious B.I.G. That story in itself, I think um, it lends so much opportunity for people to learn something different. The fact that he was Jamaican, most people didn't even realize that he was Jamaican. Yeah, they knew his mom was, but it never connected that this man was Jamaican and that he would represent that by going out there every year to see his his Gigi and his uncles. And um, you didn't know anything about his creative genius. He used to be an artist. That was his thing. He used to love to draw, uh, write poetry, like just write whatever was on his mind. Like Big was just a really charismatic genius um, from my own perspective in terms of what my beliefs are. And I think this story told that. When he also, the jazz component of his uh, neighbor, I think was yeah, a, that was a great nugget. That was, it was a great was nugget for the young MCs out there uh, and him just understanding the, and, 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 and the brother, what's the brother in the film? Um, uh, Donald? You're talking about yeah, Donald? Donald? Yeah, Donald, um, yeah. Articulating the percussive nature of his rhymes. Right. You know what I mean? That, and, and the musicality of it. Now that's something that I learned. Um, me personally about him that I, I had, it was so many different nuggets in this, this film that I learned um, just throughout the creative process. But that one with the drum percussions and him rhyming on top of it, um, that was, that one blew my mind because it, it kind of put you in the zone to understand like why his rhyme flow was so impactful. Mm-hmm. The, the, the melodies and that melodic element that he brought to, to, to hip hop was so so just so, so strong. It wasn't just him rhyming over a beat. You know what I mean? Then the other influence of country music from his mom in bed. Yeah, every every night he go into bed to this. It's like he wasn't turned on the radio to listen to it, but this is what he was influenced by. Like those things are really really critical to make you understand why he was and is, in my opinion, greatest rapper of all time. Now, D Rock. Um- the the images of y'all on the, on Fulton Avenue and just articulating um, because a lot was made of that map in the film of you know where you lived in relation to Big right and where y'all lived in relationship to your other boys and what Fulton Avenue represented at the time. Um, talk about that in the film because uh, you know I don't you know if you're not from New York and you're not from New York at that time. Uh, you don't really understand what was happening and where Big comes from because that's a whole other. What Wayne was articulating with Jamaica and his grandmother and his uncle out there in Jamaica and his mom coming to America, but then just understanding the dynamic of that Bed Stuy, Fort Greene area, Clinton Hill. Right, right. Was like where I was. Um, like I was on Notion Avenue. I lived on Gates between Bethel and Notion, and Big was on St. James between Gates and Fulton. So that was like borderline bed and Clinton Hills. You know what I mean? So it probably is like a seven, eight block difference. But I actually used to go down there to see the guy living next door to Big Chico. I used to go see him a lot because we used to go to the same school. And I just used to see Big on, a step, on his steps and shit. So then um, me and him connected dots. And then I would bring him down to uh, Beffitt where I was. <clears throat> and that's how he got up with um, 50 and Mr. C and we used to make the tapes in the basement and stuff like that. So I kind of brought him down on my down on my end. We used to hang out on both on each avenue. I'll come down there and hang with him. 
he'll come hang with me. Like I said, we had the same sense of humor. Only child, both ain't had no pop, so we kind of connected the dots. It was like almost, it's like switching, like because I used to, I used to be like admiring him because he went to like private school and stuff and wore uniforms. So I used to be like, man, I wish I could wear like a uniform to school, and then I ain't got to be worried about wearing clothes. Public school is hard when you ain't got no money. You can't wear the, you know what I'm saying? You got to wear the same shit. Like I'm switching up jeans with my boys. We switching up sneakers, shirts. I'm like, you got four outfits for the week. Like, you know what I mean? And he's like, man, it's almost like we want to switch lives. Like, you know what I mean? He wanted to be out there. And I was wishing, like, I could just, you know what I'm saying? Be, have a go to a private school and wear a uniform every day. So it was it was hard. It was kind of weird. But, you know what I mean? He, Big, just wanted to get off that block, man. He wanted to get off that block. And I get it, but. In the in the you in know. the doc, you articulate that time you took him over to get on the microphone in your neighborhood. Yeah. Um, you know, take us back to that day because that was a day of pride for you. Yeah, and plus, I was kind of new, like, like, like not new, like everybody listening to music, but I didn't really know about like dissing and ballad and all that stuff. So, the dude Preem was like really trying to get at him and shit. So I had like a little washcloth. On my hand, I'm like, damn, do I gotta like beat this dude up right now? I'm like, yo, well, look the fact that there's footage, here. the fact yeah. that there's actual old footage of you eyeballing Preem, like, yo, like, and y'all edit the way they edit the doc. You see D Rock, like, yo, I smack the shit out. Well, of and, and also yeah, D, I've watched the, I've watched the long clip before on YouTube. I've seen like the whole uh -huh. extended thing. Yo, uh -huh. your man Preem will not let Biggie rap. Like it's endless. Yeah, he would not get that mic up, right? He would not pass the mic. That's all. And then I'm like, I don't really know what's happening because I'm like, now he embarrassing me because Big down there with me. So now it look like you just handling my man. Big is big as a motherfucker. He tiny. So I'm like, hey yo, like pass the mic. And then we, uh, it, it was it was crazy though. But one of the, uh, fifty was like, nah, chill. That's like that's how I go. Like, you know what I'm saying? So they just getting at each other. So I'm like, well, he got to pass the mic or something. He was actually literally backing up. Like Big was literally reaching for the mic. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You up, see, it's like he's pulling yeah. it away from him. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. 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 he knew. He yeah. kind of knew. But Preem was known for all that little stuff. Like people had their little block parties. Preem would be the one, come up, say some rhymes, blah blah blah. But he didn't really have like, and I didn't really know Big was like that nice. To be honest with you, I just knew he get he get it in. But then I was like, oh shit. Then like I, I did feel like a sense of pride. I'm like, damn. Okay, I brought my boy down here. You know, told all y'all because it was it was more than that. Like you know, what I'm saying actually a couple more people had stepped up. Like big end up holding the title down there that 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 evening. Yeah. Another, that another thing that I found yeah. really special about the film, and, and to either of you guys, I wonder if you've you being so close to it, you must have felt it more certainly more than I'd have as a fan. But like, I really felt the film is personal. You know, Biggie has become so much larger than life that it's almost like he's become a logo. Like right. Biggie is like this Wu Tang logo or or right. a Nirvana logo. People right. who cross over into that realm of it's their iconic. brand, iconic. yeah, the mm -hmm. iconic brands, they get mm -hmm. sold so much that as a result, you you can kind of lose the human part of it. And I right. really found myself emotional afterwards and taken back to the Sunday morning when I was a high school senior or, and and found out what had happened. Was right. it, it was that a thought of you guys that like we've lost the person that he is and we've kind of just everyone gets the brand but they're not seeing the man anymore? You know what's crazy? I don't think that the world has ever seen the man the way that they've seen him now. First off, we have. We know what that was, and I think we were so um, cautious about representing that or bringing that forth that it had to be the right time, the right connection for all of us to subsequently come together and really, really make it special. Um, it, it, you can't hoard it anymore. We got to release it to the world almost, right? Because I think that we were also caught up in terms of all of the different elements that we've done to build the brand. The, the, I, the ideation of building a brand takes you away from the human element. The brand is the brand. The legacy is locked, it's loaded. We've done everything that we could do now let's give the people what they actually need so that they can understand why we did everything that we did over these last 24 years to assure that the legacy was intact. And that's to humanize them, which is again, what I said earlier, we did that here. So I think that it was important for it to happen. I think that it's necessary for a legacy to, to, to be standing and 
you know what I'm saying, connect to what you're talking to in terms of that human element and, and, and making sure that you tap into the emotions of individuals. Um, um, that's two. Go ahead, sorry. Go d You know what I realized too? Like, hmm. when uh, watching a documentary almost makes it feel like you actually whip big. Because usually when you're watching documentaries, like you're getting filmed from the crowd looking toward the stage. It actually looked like you're in Big's hotel room. You're in the car with him, mm -hmm. like leaving the dressing room with him. It's like you actually yeah. rolling with Big, just the angles. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like you with him, walking inside him. So I was looking at the other day. I never realized. I was like, damn. I was like, that's probably what, you know what I mean? Because it kind of threw me off. I'm like, that's what's making it different. Just how back then, and just think, like, we were just having fun. Nobody wasn't shooting that to, to make a documentary. You know what I'm saying? Now, if, now, D-Rock. That wasn't getting shot like that at all. D Rock in the in the doc, you know, on on multiple occasions, it's referenced like Biggs kind of, um, he was mentally prepared for disappointment. You know, the 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 record deal with Puff, he was you know apprehensive and like, yo man, like it wasn't necessarily gonna work out. And clearly, where y'all come from is a lot of disappointment, right? Losing friends, right. Exactly. For you personally, right? Because now, you know, this, this, I got a story to tell on Netflix is a lot of you, right? Um, right. How are you coping? How are you doing? Right? Because, I mean, you know, you, you're, you're somebody that's been there and, you know, disappointment is a part of this story. Right. How are you holding up? I mean, I'm good. I'm good, bro. Like I said, it even, even stems down to, to even, when when I even like took the charge for Big, it wasn't even about that. Like if Big wanted to be a fucking fireman, I still would have took the charge for him. You know what I'm saying? That's where mm -hmm. we, we was in our lives. Like somebody got to do something other than what we doing, even if it was a legit nine to five. You know what I mean? So it, it, it was it was I felt cheated in a way. You know what I mean? Like I felt cheated. Like damn. You know what I'm saying? Like what the fuck? Like when when how how do you win? Like we did everything right. We, you know we try to do the right thing, but I mean, for the most part, I say to today, like, Big Big, Big is the hardest working rapper in the game right now. You know what I mean? Like, you can listen to the radio, listen to, like, he's getting quotes. People take all his stuff. Like, he's, like, really inspired a lot of people. So I always say that to people. Like, even though he's not here, he's I think he's still one of the hardest working dudes in the game right now, man. Now, one person who we saw in the film... And, and her presence was felt, but she's maybe the biggest voice we didn't hear from, is Lil' Kim. Um, so I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, why was Kim not on camera talking about Big? Honestly, it was... Uh, they reached out. Okay. Know people, yeah, the people reached out to her and all that. That I know. I even reached out to her. They asked me to reach out to her, so I, I guess that was on her. I couldn't, I couldn't even tell you. They definitely reached out to her. You know that for a fact. Right. So. I know no, that I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, the last time I spoke to Kim about it, I know that, you know, just like you, D-Rock, and everybody involved, still a little, uh, not a little, a lot of unresolved pain. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and that's why I asked you how you was doing, man, because, yeah. you know, I, this is my first time all, after knowing you all these years of you being a public person. So I was shocked. When I saw, I ain't gonna lie. I was like, "Yo, D Rock sitting at a table in a restaurant, yeah. <laughs> talking on camera." Hey, yo, that was my spot. Yo, that was the training day joint. Never <laughs> waiting to give him that uh, money to get that warrant. The training day. That was that training day restaurant. That fool crazy. <laughs> you do is. I'm sure you was nervous, D. Keep it hundred. Like yeah. this is all brand new for you. Honestly, if it wasn't you, I probably wouldn't even be doing it. It's like. It's like basically talking to a friend, so it's not, you know yeah, what I mean? I appreciate you, it's, man. It's, it's, a, it's a little different, so you know what I mean? But it's just time, man. Like I said, I, I just wanted to share that stuff, man, and, you know, just get it out the way. But you, you nailed it. It definitely was therapy for me. You know what I mean? Because now I get to talk about the stuff I never talked about. And then, you know what I'm saying? Just Go for I, can, you. I can put it past me now. You know what I mean? Go for you, so, bro. I'm proud of you, man. How, you know, how uh, I want to ask you a little bit about just some music stuff. Um. How much do you remember about the rollout of music leading up to Ready to Die? Like, if I was to ask you specific questions about records, would you remember, or is it all kind of a blur? Um, it all depends because each song was a movie. Like, like tell tell me the fuck the world. Tell me the fuck the world movie. With the uh, MMF joint. Yeah, Big wanted to do that song really, really bad. 
really, really bad. Like he just like meth was just like popping at that time. He was just like, hey, yo, we're gonna do this joint. And um he was just excited though. Like the way Big did his music, you wouldn't really know he was doing music. Like, you know what I'm saying? Because he literally didn't use a pen and a pad type shit. Like I said, I got <laughs> I gotta tell you, you start James Such, I got a story to tell you real quick. I ain't gonna say who the artist is. Cause he ain't doing too well right now, right? So check it. We in the studio, Big doing a song with him. Big comes in, dude passes Big a pen and a pen and a pad. So Big says, "Thank you." Grab the pad and start crushing his weed up on it, right? So a couple hours go by. I go to the bathroom and shit. So the dude come in the bathroom. He's on the phone talking to the label, like, "Yo, I can't work this dude." Like he's like super unprofessional, and you know what I mean. I give him a pen and paper. He crushing his weed up on it. He's not even right. We've been sitting in there three hours. He didn't even pick up the pen yet. Nah, 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 nah. Mind you, I'm on the toilet, so I got my feet up on the door. I'm like, this nigga got to get out of here because he know I'm with Big. We just came here together. <laughs> so he gets out. The, he leaves the bathroom, so I go tell Big. I'm like, your homeboy was just on the phone crying and all, carrying on, talking about you are professional and shit. So Big was like, I don't worry about him. So boom. So about another 30 minutes go by. So Big was like, hey, yo, am I set up in there? So homeboy was like, you ready? Big was like, yeah. He's like, but you ain't even like, you know, attempt to write nothing and nothing like that. Big was like, don't worry about how I handle mine. Just am I set up in there right now? They set Big up and Big went to work. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it was just ill watching it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like being around it. That's why actually from that doc, I learned from the drummer pad. Like, I didn't know that. I learned something new. Right. You know what I'm saying? And then it makes sense for being in the studio with him. It's like, oh shit, now I see it. You know what I mean? So it's, it's man, it's every, like I said, every song is so much, it's just so much shit stacked up that I can go on for fucking hours, but I'm not, but you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, that was a good night. That was a good night. Cause even at the tension of that, like a lot of people on Wu, like they seen big coming. Like it's never, mm-hmm. it was a little, not really no friction with Wu-Tang or nothing like that. But I mean, it was, it's a sport, it's competition. You know what I mean? Hip hop is a sport, you know what I mean? So it was like a little, you know, they knew big was coming and mess and big was like really a fan of mess though. You know, Big was a fan of meth, and it was like a, a lot of weed, a lot of drinking. Well, because Biggie was already drinking. Biggie was already hot and had his buzz, and as right. that was happening, Wu Tang came out and dropped, sort of in the middle of Biggie's build. Right. That's and then Meth becomes a star. Meth becomes a star at the beginning of '94 before Biggie's album drops. So yeah. they're right at the yeah. sort of apex of blowing yeah. up at the same time. Right. Yeah. That's what I said. Yeah. You're right. You're exactly right. That was it. Uh, in this, uh, in this, I got a story to tell. Um, you know, and I, 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 we saw. I think it was in the in the notorious movie, I believe, or another piece. I don't remember, but the relationship between Puff and Big and the music making side of how you know Big was this new Brooklyn MC. He wanted to make this grimy street stuff, and Puff knew. Let's make these. Do your rap thing, but do it over these beats that I know will go in the club. D Rock, did you and Big ever have those convos where he was struggling, cre- you know, discussing that kind of push and pull and that creative process of, of getting that stuff across the line? Yeah, kind of. He Big really didn't like understand it at the time because Big was because you remember hard, really hardcore rap was in right then and there. So Big wasn't trying to do nothing near a radio record. Probably didn't even have the idea of it. Actually, I think Wayne and Mark used to. Didn't y'all used to get on him about that too? Trying to explain yeah, that to him, Wayne. And Mark used they, to get on heavy about that. Yeah, used to get on. So they they used to go at it, but not really to the point where it was a fallout or nothing. But but creative, like all right, man. I'm he was all creative. It. He was yeah. all creative. Yeah. He was yeah. pushing. I think he was pushing big, and you know what I'm saying. It wasn't that big was pushing back. It was just he just as D Rock just said he didn't understand he didn't understand what it was to make radio records and I think Puff had to make him understand that. Yeah, because uh, you know that M two may be you know those first few records, you know it was there was no brainer records already and then you put Big's amazing rhymes on top of them. Right. It was just through the roof and they were right. instant, right. instant. Yeah, but at that time that wasn't New York hip hop either. That's right. That's right. You know what I mean? So I think he was also battling that. that you know, he's from Brooklyn. You know, this is my life. This is what I do. I'm not with that shit, nigga. I'm doing, I'm doing this. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think it was more of that than anything. Wayne, what do you think Biggie's path would have been? 
um, post life after death. Um, he wanted to get into business. He had the clothing brand, and we've seen where hip hop has gone. Where do you think Biggie's story would have would have taken us? I, I say this all the time: the way that we see hip hop and branding today started there, um, and a lot of these brothers, um, you know, what I'm saying, took that and ran with it, you know, in his passing because he's no longer here to deliver on it. Um, he had already had the clothing line. Uh, him and Heavy were talking about opening up that restaurant together. That there were so many different things that transpired in his brain um, from a business standpoint. One thing about Big E is about his money. He didn't care if he was selling oranges on the corner or getting on the mic to rap. Like at the end of the day, it was always about the bread. So he was always thinking ahead. And I think that he would have kind of, as he did, paved the way from a branding standpoint and turning that brand into a business that was then liquidated into something greater. Well, I think that, and and the proof is in even just the Junior Mafia branding and how he set the stage for, you know, creating this, uh, you know, the group and the Kim path and these, these personas for his, you know, for his team. And even what you was doing, D-Rock, right? Filming, you know, documenting footage, making sure the tours were set up. Like, all of y'all really leaned in to what the total business was. Yeah, mm -hmm. we was learning, though. Ready to die, we was, like, learning everything as we was going along. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, we was literally learning the game as we was doing it. Like, I mean, you got to think. Big had a four-year run and did... What four classic albums did what Ready to Die, Life After Death, Little Kim Hardcore, uh, Junior Mafia, you know what I mean? So, four years he had four classic albums. So, in the process of that, us learning the game, learning on the road, we took our bumps and bruises, you know what I mean? But we was learning this why I said that Life After Death was really we already got that part now, it was really time to go. Like, we was already focused, we learned the game. Like, that's why I said almost feel we feel cheated, like, you know what I mean? Because that was our that was our time right there. Yeah, we start tour that week after. Yep. Um, hey, D Rock. One thing uh, I interviewed Jay Z <clears throat> many years ago, and we asked about his relationship with Biggie and and how much he references Biggie and how important he was. And it really wasn't clear to me until that point how their relationship evolved. And you know that he, as he explains it, over the last sort of year, year and a half of of Big's life, they became very close and spoke every day. Do you remember sort of the emergence of the Jay Z Biggie friendship? Yeah, for sure. We used to um we used to eat We lost your audio. We D lost your We lost your audio. Wait, we lost your audio back. from when you said um we used to eat. We hear you now though. We hear you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we used to um once a week if we'd take turns with Jay wherever he's at, we'd fly, meet him there. The following week, wherever we at, he'll fly, meet us. We used to eat dinner once a week. But I remember, like, um, they really, really got – well, we was tight because, like I said, we was from the same neighborhood kind of. Jay was kind of close toward me, being near Marcy and Nostrum. But um, who shot you? I remember pulling up on Jay in front of Apollo. Big was in the passenger seat. He just rolled down the window, passed him a cassette tape, and was like, yo, just pull off. By the time we got back on the West Side Highway, Jay was calling like, hey, yo, what is this? You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, this is crazy what you're doing right now. So, like, right right around then, they got really, really tight. But both of them was working. So we didn't see each other every day, but we made it our business to hook up at least twice a month. Like, you know what I mean? Like, every other week, we would connect to Dosco, eat dinner, rather be in Miami, uh, Chicago. You know what I mean? Like, wherever we were, where if it made sense, we would definitely connect to Dosco Do or even come to the studio. Do you think Big had high expectations and like would have believed that Jay would have become who Jay eventually became? He told me that. Really? He Big said that out his own mouth. Yep. He said, "Yo, dude is about to go." He's like, "Dude is nice." Dead President was one of Big's favorite songs. He said to that all every all day in the car. He's like, "Yo, dude is everybody honestly, everybody Big pointed out kind of went like he knew he knew his music, yo. He would always say that. He's like, yo, that's the competition, that's the competition. That's like he would point out, and to this day, everybody he point out is sitting up, sitting pretty right now. Mm. Um D Rock and Wayne, this is a question for both of y'all. You know, um, we see a lot of young people going through losing, you know, uh 
friends and artists that they love, like what just happened with Pop Smoke, and this has, you know, been happening in and around hip hop <coughs> because of its proximity to people coming from the street and, you know, just things going on. Um, while while we have you guys uh, and you're sharing this story about one of the m- most major losses in, in hip hop, um, which is B.I.G., do you guys have any words um, to, to help, you know, families and friends who are dealing with these losses in real time, right? King Von, Pop Smoke, a lot of these guys are really right on the verge of, of taking off in their musical careers. I don't know, Wayne or D-Rock, if you guys have any words for those, for people and families dealing with that right now. I mean, I would say keep their name alive in a positive way. And, I mean, it gets better. Like, you know what I mean? It gets better. You got to deal with it, face it. Don't don't hide it. Don't, don't, no, don't bury it. Just just deal with it straight on. And definitely you got to keep their name alive to the best that you can. You know what I mean? And, and, and try to finish off what they're trying to do. Just let people see them in a different light. You know, they make them learn something about them they don't know, but you have to keep their name alive. You got to, you got, you have to. Um, ooh, that's, um, I mean, when it comes to, to pain, I think that, you know, we all have to face that with love and, you know, in order to do that, you yourself have to love yourself. And in so doing, I think that that allows you then to kind of open your heart and kind of not let go, but move on. Because moving on allows you at that point to kind of carve a path forward that keeps their name alive, as D-Rock said. But on top of keeping their name alive, it's about building a legacy. So if they were on the cusp of, that means that they still can be. Whatever it is in your heart you believe that they want it to be is what you should continue to push forward on. That would give you the sense of, of comfort that you need because you're connected to what their dream was. Powerful, yeah. man. Yo, fellas, I really appreciate y'all, man. I, I look when I when I saw the promo for I got a story to tell, I was like, what else is there to be said? <laughs> and then I saw the doc, Rosenberg will tell you, we both I was like, I don't even know I don't even know what to ask. Questions when these brothers come on the show, but the doc is so incredible and shows a layer of BIG we we didn't anticipate that we'd even get a, 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 a chance to share with you guys and D-Rock and Wayne and Miss Wallace and the whole family. Thank you so much uh, for just Appreciate sharing you, with us and, and continuing to, uh, like you guys just articulated, keep the legacy alive. And not only that, but make sure the legacy isn't just tarnished by the bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Right. It is about yeah. him as a human and what he contributed to this culture of hip hop. Uh, that has given us all a path to feed our families. I mean, and, and yep. you know, you know how many conversations Ebro and I have had over the years. We've been fortunate enough to interview almost everybody associated with Big. So the idea that a film would come out, and when someone asked me, "Did you learn anything new?" My response right. was, "The entire first hour, I didn't know anything. <laughs> like I was, I was sitting there watching his uncle and his grandmother." And I'm right. like, yo, right. I didn't know these characters in his story. And I consider right. myself right. to be basically <laughs> as big a fan as you could be. So right. Right. congratulations, you guys, for the most hardcore or novice fan. It's an incredible piece of work. And you, it, 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 it helps hip hop and helps Biggie's legacy. Well done. Bless you, brother. Thank you, bro. Appreciate y'all, man. Love you guys, man. Love right, you, yo, brothers. Congrats. See you soon, bro. D-Rock, I'll see you in a minute, man. Thanks, guys. Wayne, I love you, brother. I always talk to love you, too. You,